distinguished supervisors, professors, academics, postgraduate students, supporters, and of course, to our three MT contestants. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I'm very pleased to welcome everyone here to the exciting final round of 3MT UKM competition for the year 2017. Selamat datang and ahlan wa sahlan bikum. Ladies and gentlemen, 3-Minute Thesis Competition is a research communication competition developed by the University of Queensland, Australia. This competition tests our contestants who are PhD students in conveying their research for a non-expert audience in just three minutes. The challenge is to make the technical study sound simple, convincing, without compromising the essence of the research. It may sound simple, but actually it is not so easy to achieve. How do you explain your research to a layman using simple terms so that they clearly comprehend the importance of your research in only three minutes? This is where creativity, intelligence, and effective communication skills play the ultimate role. As, Arab, and as an Arabic proverb says, ma qalla wa dalla, meaning brevity is the soul of wit. So, ladies and gentlemen, for your information, the contestants are competing in three clusters, which are engineering, science and technology, and also science social. This year, we received 34 participants competing in the preliminary round, which was held on the 3rd of March, where 17 finalists were selected by juries to compete in the final round this morning. There you are. Give a round big applause for our finalists. Three best candidates from each cluster will be representing UKM at the national level at 3MT that will be held at University Technology Petronas on the 9th of May 2018. Ladies and gentlemen, the finalists were given extensive training by experienced trainers to improve their presentation, communication skills and fluency. We had the opportunity to work with Dr. Wahizawahi from Chitra. I saw you. Yeah. Dr. Abdul Latif from FSSK. He's not here. Dr. Noor Hazlin Hazrin Chong from FST. Okay. Both Dr. Latif and Dr. Noor Hazrin are former 3MT contestants at University of Queensland. So, thank you very much to the amazing coaches to, for their priceless knowledge. I am certain that the training provided increased tremendously the students' level of confidence and dissemination into a whole new exciting level. I really hope that we can snatch the first place at the national round and be able to represent Malaysia at the international 3MT competition in Australia this uh, coming, uh, in this uh, 2018. How exciting, isn't it? All right. <laughs> Very uh, uh, um, full of hope, okay? So ladies and gentlemen, any competitions are not complete without juries. Today, we are extremely honoured to have our honourable juries from various backgrounds of expertise. Please welcome Yang Berbahagia Professor Dr. Supian Hussein, Director of Institute of Malay World and Civilization. Please welcome Yang Berbahagia Professor Dr. Ismail Baba, our Head of Jury today. President of Malaysian Association of Social Workers. Please welcome Yang Berbahagia, Professor Dr. Zarina Abdul Latif, Professor of Pediatrics, UKM Medical Center. And Yang Berbahagia, Madam Nurul Shuhada Nurul Ain Muhammad Zain, TV presenter. Thank you for your time and your uh, uh, expertise this morning. While I'm standing here, I would like to express my gratitude to the supervisors who did 
an incredible job to encourage and support the supervisees to take up this challenge. To all the professors, deans, directors, fellow academics and representatives from industries and government agencies, it, it truly is our privilege to have your presence and support in this event. And I also, without doubt, enjoy working with my diligent 3MT organizing committee members. They are all wearing gold today, bright gold, okay, who are very enthusiastic young lecturers from the Faculty of Social Sciences and Humanities, Faculty of Science and Technology, and Faculty of Engineering, and also my devoted team at the UKM Graduate Center and Graduate Ambassador. Thank you very much to all of you. I also would like to take this opportunity to thank Professor Dr. Andana Tuti Mokhtar for her trust and support to our team in organizing such event since 3MT was introduced to UKM from the absolutely beginning and this fantastic year marks the fourth year. Unbelievable. Thank you, Prof. <laughs> okay, finally, but the most importantly to our 3MT finalists. I would like to take this moment to congratulate all of you from the bottom of my heart for your efforts and courage to share your passion of research with us. Give them a big round of applause. I do believe that pitching your hard work of two years and above of your research in three minutes or 180 uh, seconds is absolutely mind-blowing. Some might say impossible, an 80,000 word thesis would take 540 minutes to present. If that sounds easy, 540 minutes is actually nine full, uh, nine full hours. So, however, you only have three minutes to do so, which is utterly magnificent. Once again, congratulations and prepare yourself for the challenge of your lifetime as the impossible will be made possible today and witness as these young researchers achieve the incredible. Are you ready? Yes. Motivated? Yes. yes. Possible or not, you will prove it. Don't limit your challenges, but challenge your limits. All the best to you. Bitaufik wan najah. Thank you very much. Wassalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Distinguished guests from industries and government agencies, fellow academics, three empty contestants, postgraduate students, ladies and gentlemen, salam sejahtera dan salam satu Malaysia. Terlebih dahulu, saya ingin mengucapkan sampai uh, menyampaikan salam daripada yang berbahagia Tan Sri Datuk Sri Dr Nor Azlan Ghazali, Nak Chancellor Universiti Kebangsaan Malaysia, yang pada saat akhir seperti disebut oleh Dr Wan Halana Wan Hana Melini tadi tidak dapat hadir ke Majlis 3MT pada pagi ini kerana menghadiri Majlis Amanat Perdana Perkhidmatan Awam ke-16 di PICC Putrajaya. Dan sehubungan dengan itu, beliau telah memohon saya untuk mewakili beliau pada pagi ini di Pusat Siswaza. Untuk selanjutnya, saya mohon izin untuk meneruskan dalam bahasa Inggeris bagi manfaat hadirin antarabangsa. So ladies and gentlemen, if you allow me please, I would like to share the irony. Um, later on, we will be hearing and listening to a whole thesis delivered in three minutes and yet you have to bear with long speeches at the beginning. Nah. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, speeches can't be actually presented in three minutes. So that's the irony. Alhamdulillah, praise to Allah Almighty for granting us the opportunity to gather for this auspicious occasion on this fine morning. First and foremost, I would like to extend a very warm welcome to everyone, to our humble graduate center at the University Kebangsaan Malaysia, especially to our friends from the industries and government agencies. Selamat datang ke Universiti Kebangsaan Malaysia. Thank you for all your interest and effort to be here today and to lend support to the finals of the 3MT UKM competition. And I think I'd like to uh, express my warmest welcome to our friend from Penang who flew in today from Osram uh, just to attend our 3MT competition this morning. And also our guests from, uh, from Petronas, I hear. So the UKM Graduate Centre 
regularly organizes interdisciplinary student activities that encourage participation of diverse groups of students, such as today, with the aim of providing a platform to enhance the development of our postgraduates' personal and professional competency. So we do not wish that our students focus solely on the completion of their master's and PhD theses, but rather we would also like them not to neglect the soft skills that are so important in these days and era. I believe the industries and employers know that only too well. As such, in preparation for today, as mentioned by Dr. Ashi just now, we have organized several training sessions for the students to further develop and hone their public speaking skills. And in addition, our Graduate Center also plays a major role in offering additional professional skills, trainings, and mentorship to our postgraduates. We are very active in organizing workshops, research and writing skills, workshop seminars, public lectures, industrial visits and forums, all in the hope of benefiting the postgraduate community in UKM. But not only in UKM, we have many also students coming from neighboring universities. If you care to follow us on Facebook, our Facebook address is Pusat Siswaza UKM. Uh, you will soon see photos of your good self on the uh, Facebook soon enough because we are very, very active, apparently, on Facebook. For the past few weeks, I have seen the final contestants attending their training sessions in preparation for today, and I'm proud that their pitching skills have improved tremendously. I'm sure the skills they have picked up are not only useful for today, but also should also last a last lifetime. And at this juncture, I would like to, be uh, I would like to wish um, all the best to our contestants Make UKM proud in the national level competition, inshallah. Our postgraduate students hail from various places in the world. As we can see today, we have contestants coming from Libya, Oman, Kazakhstan, and in the preliminary sessions, we also had students from um, Pakistan and Sudan. Yeah? And not to forget, of course, our local talents competing to represent UKM in the national level competition. And this is going to be held in University Technology Petronas, as mentioned earlier. Now, I would like to address our special guests from the industry and government agencies. We at UKM are keen to share our research experience, results and innovations. I strongly feel that collaboration between industry and university is a must and essential to push our national research agenda forward. Input from industry is valuable and serves as the basis for us, the scientists, to do research. So we hope that this platform today can help ignite the spirit of togetherness and cooperation between us. We look forward to your ideas and future collaboration, and we certainly hope at the same time you will enjoy our pitching sessions today on the various research in initiatives going on in our campus. And we certainly hope they will be useful in spurring collaboration between us. Ladies and gentlemen, I would also like to thank the distinguished judges for spending your precious time judging today, headed by Professor Dr. Ismail Baba. Thank you very much, Professor Dr. Supian Hussein, Professor Dr. Zarina Abdul Latif, and of course, Madam Nurul Shuhada Nurul Ain Muhammad Sain. We sincerely appreciate your time and effort in making our contest a success. And working together, we are preparing the students for their future careers and helping the workforce of tomorrow. Last but not least, this event has been realized through the commitment given by the UKM 3MT Com Organizing Committee, led by our very own Dr. Ashinida Aladin. I see that her enthusiasm, energy, leadership, and goldness <laughs> has kept the team together, working tirelessly to ensure the successful running of today's um, event. A big thank you and congratulations to the team, uh, of course also comprising of many academics from the faculties and also from the team at the UKM Graduate Centre. Thank you very much. Dengan itu, dengan lafaz bismillahirrahmanirrahim, saya dengan sukacitanya merasmikan pertandingan 3-Minute Thesis Peringkat Universiti Kebangsaan Malaysia. Thank you and wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.
is a lady from the Faculty of Pharmacy, Ms. Chin Chai Yi. Okay, she will talk on Moringa Oliveira, a potential okay. approach for diabetic wounds. Ms. Hello. Chin. Testing, testing. Do you know that in three minutes, there will be six diabetic patients who will be losing their limb like, throughout, like, in, in the between when they have the diabetes because like, their wounds have really hard to be treated. So, and because today, I wanted to take three minutes today to talk about diabetic wound healing. A, a normal wound healing would take about five to seven days for complete healing. However, it's not the same case for these diabetic patients. And uh, because of the diabetic wounds are really hard to be treated, and it easily will be infected and also tissue damages eventually leading to diabetic foot ulcers and limb amputation as a worse outcome. So this has caused really high healthcare burdens and a uh, longer hospital stay for the patients. According to WHO report last year, this will be in a one in a five Malaysian adults above 50 have been diagnosed with diabetes and about 20% of them have diabetic foot ulcers. And recently, and they are quite limited of medical dressing are being treated, specifically treated uh, diabetic foot ulcers. They're also lacking of natural plant-derived dressing to treat foot ulcers as well. So even though we have used natural plant extract to become a wound treatment in the past. So in my PhD research work, I'm focused on development of wound dressing to incorporate with natural plant extract, which is Moringa or Sphera leaf extract. And throughout the study, we have found many potential compounds which help to promote wound healing and reduce inflammations. And we also have successfully formulated this Moringa leaf extract into a cost-effective film dressing every minimum side effect for long-term usage. So, and when we come to the most exciting part of this research is this Moringa film could heal the diabetic wound within 7 to 14 days instead of 21 days. So this could reduce the diabetic wound from getting infected before the progression of the diabetic foot ulcers. So this is a, could show that this Moringa film dressing is a really potential uh, wound dressing to be treated for the wound, diabetic wounds or diabetic foot ulcers. So I, I hope that this study will provide some new insight and useful medical invention in treating diabetic foot ulcers. And thank you. Thank you, Ms. Chin. Moringa oleifera yeah. seed is widely researched as coagulant alternative for water treatment. Something that I know, I thought that I might share with you. Okay, can I have one of the judges to provide some constructive comments to Ms. Chin? So we will start with Madam Nurul Ain, please. Yeah, yeah, I can't hear you. Chin uh, well, um... Yi. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, um, basically, um, I'm the non expert audience. Yeah. Well, basically, um, what can I. You look very nervous. Yeah, I do. But uh, towards the end, yeah. when you talk under the pressure, I think you slightly becoming better yeah. because I can really catch up all your points. Yeah. Because before that, I. What I can see, you just repeat, repeating the same points again and again. Yeah, yeah. So I'm uh, trying to, mm. to to get the G's of it. Yeah, yeah. But basically, you're doing fine towards the end. Yeah. And how I wish you all the best. All right, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Madam Nurulain. And thank you, Ms. Chin. All right, thank you. So the result, I think, looks very convincing. And I think we'll provide alternatives to the diabetic patients. Our next speaker is from the Faculty of Science and Technology who will tell us a story about the survival story of expansion protein in Antarctica. Please welcome Mrs. Noraisha Mohamed Noor. Have you ever wondered how it's like to be a permanent resident of Antarctica? We all know that Antarctica is extremely cold, barren, with temperatures that can drop to as low as minus 80. Yet, there are organisms that can actually survive in this very harsh condition. Surviving in Antarctica requires adaptation, and here's where my research interest lies. Now, if you've ever seen pictures of Antarctica, 
there's really nothing much to see, right? But did you know that underneath the sea ice, there's a porous channel filled with salt water? All sorts of organisms can be trapped inside these channels during its formation, such as krills, crustaceans, plankton, and even bacteria. This can all serve as a nutrient source for the organism living inside the ice. And in my research, I'm working to understand how Antarctic microbes look for food. The microbes that I'm working on is a yeast called Glasozyma antarctica. We found that this yeast is able to produce a unique protein called expansin. Why is this protein unique? Well, expansin works by targeting and loosening plant cell wall. And once the cell wall is loosened, it will be easier to digest. But in Antarctica, there is practically no land plants. So why does the protein that targets plant cell wall is there in the first place? Why do the yeast need to produce it for? To answer this question, we have to understand how the protein structure looks like. Using combinations of protein modeling softwares, we build the structure of this expansion and compare it with similar reported structures. What we found is actually something very exciting. In the new structure, the area that should bind to plant cell wall now looks different. Instead of recognizing plant cell wall, it now looks like a cell wall of a diatom, which is a plankton in the sea ice ecosystem. Well, what does this mean? It means that the Antarctic yeast is able to adapt and evolve to the type of nutrients available around them. Of course, we still need further validation, but this would be the first reported structure of expansion protein from an Antarctic organism. Now, discussions on the potential applications is still underway, but we hope that our finding will open up other research interests on the possibilities of life in the extreme. That life is possible anywhere. There's so much we can learn from a yeast living in the Antarctic. And one thing we can learn from this microbe is that whenever things get extreme, we may as well adapt. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Noraisha. It is really interesting to learn how a tiny organism can survive in extreme cold weather. We will give a little bit of room for the contestant to get you know, her breath back and also for the judges to keep some marks. Okay, uh, thank you, Noraisha. I thought that was uh, well done. Okay, I uh, like the way that you presented and spoke very clearly and you gave a good logical sequence eh? and uh, it was... Uh, Quite well understood, I thought. So it was a good attempt. Well done. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. So next speaker is Mrs. Azmawati Muhammad Nawi from UKM Medical Molecular Biology Institute, Umbi. She will give a talk entitled Attack on the Clone. Oops, sorry. Not the clone. Attack on the Colon. Episode 3, Colopredal for CRC. Mrs. Azmawati, the floor is yours. Testing, testing. Have you ever watched Star Wars movie? If yes, you should know one of the episodes entitled Attack of the Clones. The story is about how the soldiers want to protect their colony from the civil war. Ladies and gentlemen, today it is not a storytelling session for Star Wars, but I will talk about Attack on the Colon. In the movie, the soldiers want to protect their colony. But you and I want to protect our colon from developing colorectal cancer. Colorectal cancer, or CRC, is the second common cancer in Malaysia. Both genetic and environmental factors are the contributor to CRC. It has been proven that our lifestyle, mainly diet intake, physical activity, smoking, alcohol consumption, obesity, contribute to the higher risk of CRC. What about trace element? Have you heard about selenium, zinc, mercury, plumbum? They exist in very small quantity, but their influence is huge on our body function. How lifestyle relate with the trace element in our body? What you eat, 
what you drink, what you smoke, all contain this element. Even worse, if you are fat or inactive, your trace element balance may disturb and you may have higher risk of CRC. The first episode, the beginning of the saga, it took a year for me to develop a method of multi-element detection in human blood by using a sensitive instrument, ICPMS. We have successfully developed a precise and accurate method to measure 25 elements in one single analysis. This is an innovation by itself. The second episode, we interview patients with CRC and non-CRC for their lifestyle. With the data, the third episode begins. We apply machine learning algorithms to develop a prediction model of CRC. We name it Colopradel. What do we have so far? Colopradel is able to predict accurately more than 90% of CRC cases. Is this good enough? Yes. If you want to protect your colon, you need to know your risk. If your risk is high, change your lifestyle, achieve the balance of the trace element and keep away CRC. Having said that, colopodes needs further validation. Therefore, an episode attack on the colon will be continued. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Asmawati. I think the next time we watch Star Wars movie, we will immediately think about colon. Can I have Prof. Ismail, please, to give some comments? Uh, thank you very much, uh, As Asma Wati. I think you're, you managed to uh, cover your content in three minutes, and you are quite, and it's quite comprehensive. And also, in terms of communication, I think um, you managed to uh, use your verbal and nonverbal cues very well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now comes the turn for Mr. Jasper Elvin James from the Faculty of Health Sciences to give his talk on combating fungal infections is about making the right choice. Mr. Jasper. Good morning, everyone. Can you hear me? Back in 2010, a 55-year-old woman with eight children was diagnosed with ovarian cancer. Both her ovary and her womb had to be removed. That woman is my mother. I clearly remember the sufferings that she had to bear due to the side effects of chemotherapy, such as hair loss, fatigue, vomiting, and the worst part, it lowered her immune system, a condition also known as immunocompromised. Apart from cancer patients, premature baby, the elderly, and patients with other chronic diseases are also categorized as immunocompromised. They are defenseless against fungal infections. What made it worse? Most antifungal that are used today are no longer effective in killing the fungus, a phenomena known as antifungal resistance. This problem has contributed to a large number of deaths worldwide, especially among immunocompromised patients. That is what inspired my PhD thesis. We study a type of fungus called Fusarium, the cause of infections in humans, animals, and even plants. In a healthy person, they can cause infection to our skin, our nail, and even our eyes. In fact, between the year 2005 to 2006, Malaysia, Singapore, and the United States were shocked by an outbreak of eye infections caused by this particular fungus. In our study, we asked questions on how they become resistant toward that antifungal. In our findings, we discovered that they undergo mutations which contribute to the overproduction of fungal protein targeted by the antifungal, making them ineffective. Thus, we have designed a tool to detect that specific mutations which is the key to antifungal resistance. So what is the significance? This tool will enable us to have an early indication of fungal, antifungal resistance. This information will be very valuable for our medical doctors to assist them in selecting an effective antifungal drugs from, for treatment. 
Just imagine you are being treated with antifungal that is not effective at all. Wouldn't that only make it worse for patients that are already suffering? The results of my study will help us in taking a very important step to save thousands of lives. My name is Jasper. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Jasper. Right choice indeed. Can I have comments from Professor Dr. Supian, please? Oh, very good morning. Uh, excellent, very impressive. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, you sound cool, you look cool. Um, the way you presented your content um, is very related to what you showed on the screen and, um, and, 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 and you, know, you presented it accordingly. So that I find uh, very good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We shall continue the event with Mr. Nazmi Harith Fazila from the Institute of System Biology in Biosis, who will present a topic on pregnancy tests for early detection of red palm weevil infested trees. Good morning, everyone. Hello. How do you eliminate a threat when we cannot find them? This is the concern of palm trees growers worldwide who are being affected by the red palm weevil outbreak. Coconut, oil palm, dates, all are being decimated by this insect pest. The problem of controlling this insect pest is that they hide inside the trees and killing the trees from inside. Now, any infested trees will show symptoms of infestation, so we will know where they are. But at that point in time, it is far too late to save the trees. Finding an infested trees early is key to saving the trees and controlling the red palm weevil outbreak. But how on earth are we supposed to do that? The early infested trees and the unaffected trees look exactly the same. To this, our research studied the symptoms of infestation at the molecular level. Our studies is inspired by how a pregnancy test kit works. A pregnancy test kit detects for a molecule called the human chorionic gonadotrophin. If such molecule is present, then it will show a positive for pregnancy. This molecule is called biomarkers for indicating pregnancy. Likewise, in our research, we are trying to find one or perhaps more molecule that can be biomarkers for indicating a red palm weevil infested trees. To find this molecule, we studied how a palm tree responds to a red palm weevil attacks. Trees know when they are being harmed, and they do respond accordingly. We use a molecular analytical approach that allows us to identify and measure all protein molecules within the plant tissue. In our studies, we have two groups of trees. One where we leave them as they are, and the other, where we purposely infest them with a red palm weevil. We then take samples from each group at the early stage of the attacks. This is before any physical symptoms of infestation can appear. We compare the protein content between these two groups. What we are looking for are the proteins molecules that have been produced so much or so little under the red palm weevil infested groups. These protein molecules are potential biomarkers. They can tell us whether a tree is being infested or not before any physical symptoms can appear, thus allowing us to have an early detection for red palm weevil. Our biomarkers can be developed further as a novel tool for red palm weevil infestation detection. With early detection comes an early insect control. Thank you. Wow, this is the first time I learned that a pregnancy test kit has more to offer than its commonly known main function. But can we go back to Ms. Madam uh, Nurul Ain, please, for your comment? Okay, Nazmi, um, your title very capturing. Really captured my eyes. Using <laughs> Thank you very the much. I know something about pregnancy tests now. <laughs> well, your choice of words are very easy to understand. Um, it be very easy to understand, and then you have a very good uh, facial uh, expressions, and you are also good at emphasizing your point as well. So well done and good luck. Thank you very much. 
The sixth speaker is a lady from Umbi, Mrs. Noor Fazila Ahmad, who will be talking on gene environment interaction in diabetic kidney disease. Make a sound for Mrs. Noor Fazila. Diabetes mellitus is on the rise. World Health Organization reported that one in 11 people has this disease. One of the complications is diabetic kidney disease means the kidneys fail to function. This can lead to end-stage kidney disease requiring dialysis or the patient may die. Diabetic kidney disease is commonly influenced by our unhealthy environment such as sedentary lifestyle, unbalanced diet, smoking, obesity, and many more. Despite tremendous effort to live in a healthier environment, 20 to 30% of patients still develop kidney disease. This causes a lot of frustration to the patients and the treating doctors. It also indicates the role of genetic in this disease. What is genetic? Genetic is a study of genes in living organism. Genes are segments in our DNA, and our DNA is made up of millions of single building blocks, or nucleotide. Variation in this nucleotide will tell us whether we have curly hairs, blue eyes, at risk to certain disease, or how we respond to treatment. What if we have a simple genetic test to predict kidney disease? Wouldn't that be great? My thesis is looking into three things. One, I'm inventing a gene panel of 32 single nucleotide variants. These variants are selected based on their highly predictive value towards kidney disease. Two, I'm looking at the environmental factor, meaning the lifestyle of these patients. And number three, to develop this gene panel, I must understand what is the gene and environment interaction in predicting kidney disease. Ladies and gentlemen, we Malaysians, we live in a special environment vastly influenced by our social and cultural background. The way we eat, the way we exercise, we have not finished dealing with smoking, now comes vaping. Not forgetting, we are the most obese population in Southeast Asia. Therefore, sorry, <laughs> our genetic makeup is also unique. Therefore, I am taking the first step to invent a gene panel to predict kidney disease customized to a Malaysian population, hoping that in the future, these steps will turn into a steps of leaders in understanding the mechanism of kidney disease prediction and prevention. With that, I thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Nurfazila. We wish you all the very best in develop, developing the gene panel. Can we have some comments from Prof. Zarina, please? Thank you, uh, Nurfazila. I, I thought, uh, I think genetics is always a complicated topic. Eh? So I thought you handled that very well, right? You explained it clearly, okay? And I like that you gave a logical explanation on why is it important to do this disease. So well done. I thought it was good. Our next speaker is a researcher from the Faculty of Medicine, Mrs. Noor Hamzani Farizan. Her topic is very interesting with the question, childhood drowning, are you watching your child? It's a bright sunny day, a perfect weather for a picnic. For most of us, especially our young children, Playing with water means a lot of fun and adventure. However, it can turn out to be the most terrified things in our life. It only takes about this much, around 2 inch or less than 6 cm, either at the beach, river, pool, or even in a very small bucket. Drowning can happen without a sound. It's quick and silent, even there's plenty of people around. Childhood drowning. Are you watching your child? Are we? Are we watching our kids close enough to know that in our country, around 500 to 600 of children drown in a year? It's about two kids die in every single day due to drowning. In summary, 
Drowning is the number two killer of our children after the road traffic injury. Terrified, isn't it? So what can we do? In developed countries such as Australia, New Zealand, UK and many more, drowning prevention campaign and water safety education is widely being promoted to reduce drowning in children. As in our country, it's the beginning of the conversation. Thus, this is what I did for my study. I start with a question on what people really know about drowning, how they feel about drowning, what they do to stop drowning from happen. With 15 interviews, a survey involved 700 parents, 800 children, and a collaboration with the Malaysian National Water Safety Council, I developed the Be Safe. It's a drowning prevention and water safety guideline. With Be Safe guideline, I'm trying to educate the families, reduce the injuries, and the most important thing is to save life. Ladies and gentlemen, drowning is predictable and preventable if you learn to be safe. In the Be Safe guideline, we learn safe as supervise, alert, learn the first aid, and educate. To supervise, you need a close, proper, and adequate supervision. Alert and aware of the drowning risk. For example, picnic during a bad weather? No, no, no. Pack it up and just leave the place. Stay safe. Learn your first aid. Get to know your doctor's A, B, C, D. It's a CPR, a rescue technique, a a step you need to take to step, save a life. And last but not least, educate our children to be a water aware. Know how to swim, swim with an adult, know the safety signage, and many more. This is what we can do, this is what we can learn. Our action can save our children. Keep watch your child, learn to be safe, to stay safe. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Nur Hamzani. My daughters love swimming in the pool and sometimes I took my eyes from them to check on messages. So thank you very please much for the safe. reminder. Yes. Can we have Prof. Ismail to comment, please? Uh, thank you very much, uh, Hamzani. Uh, I think your, your topics, I guess all of us could relate to. You know, I'm sure all of us have children mm -hmm. and we want our children to be safe. Uh, in the water. Your problem statement and your uh, research questions are clearly stated and I think and also quite comprehensive and um, you engage with the audience very well and you're very relaxed and, and thank you very much and all the best. Thank you. Aha, someone from my hood. Please welcome Mr. Chin Chuin Hao from the Faculty of Engineering and Build Environment, who is our next presenter and will speak on Fatigue Life Predictive Model, Make the Life Simple. Can you hear me? When we talk about fatigue, many of us might think that it means the tiredness of our body. But in engineering context, fatigue is a kind of mechanical failure of materials under cyclic loading allows me to give you a simple illustration. Imagine I'm taking a thin copper wire and I bend the wire up and down for a few times. The wire will eventually break into two due to fatigue damage. You can try this at your home because it is a very simple experiment. In automotive industry, fatigue has been a major problem because it contributes to 90% of mechanical failures in our car. As you can see from the picture, the suspension failure is mainly due to fatigue, and it will jeopardize the life of the passenger if it feels while the car is moving. Ladies and gentlemen, this is why the durability analysis is so important to determine the service life of the suspension components and prevent early failure. However, the conventional durability analysis is very complex time-consuming and costly. This is because the durability tests require huge amount of data and expensive instruments. Today, I'm going to propose a solution for this problem. My research aims to establish a fatigue life predictive model that can replace the conventional durability analysis. So, my methodology of my research involves several elements. First, I will do the finite element analysis to study the structural properties. And then, the signal processing to study the signal behavior. 
Next, I will do the multi-body dynamic analysis to simulate the behavior of the suspension system under real working conditions. And last but not least, I will need the durability analysis to determine the fatigue life. When I put all these analysis together, the model that I develop will be able to predict the fatigue life without the needs of any experimental data. And this will significantly reduce the development time and cost of the suspension systems. And indirectly, this will make our car become cheaper and benefit all of us. Most importantly, I can finally tell the engineers out there that they can finally enjoy their life because I will make the life simpler. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chin. You know, we expect nothing less from engineers. You have to make our lives simpler. Yeah. Prof. Dr. Supian, please. Uh, I like the way you started your speech by giving a keyword that will trigger you know, immediate understanding and, and uh, the schema of, yeah, of the schema. audience. And, um, uh, and I also like the way you present your body language, you know, uh, and also perhaps, you know, your tone, the tempo of your voice is, is, is very good, it's pace. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Our next speaker hails from the ninth biggest country in the world, Kazakhstan. Ms. Almagul Tuspikova will talk on English oral communication practice in secondary schools. Please welcome Ms. Tuspikova. Good morning. When I came to Malaysia as an exchange student from Kazakhstan, I remember how at the airport I was feeling so lost and nervous. And when I decided to ask the one Malay lady where was the immigration checkpoint, when I approached her, I felt very bad. I knew English, but it was so hard for me to speak it. From that moment, I became curious. Is it uh, the same with the other people in my country or in Malaysia or in international students? So as I observed, the problem of English communication exists in all countries in the Asian context. And that's where I became interested and got inspired. Well, the literature shows that there are many factors that influence the way we acquire oral communication. And why? Because we learners, we are humans. And as the humans, first of all, we bring our personality into the classroom. And secondly, we have many people around us who actually influence the parents, the teachers, and uh, our friends. So, and lastly, there is a bigger educational policy and the cultural context that influence the way we perceive the things. So in my research, I'm looking at these components, how they relate with each other, and how they affect the development of English speaking skills among the language learners in my country. So to do so, I use classroom observations and I interview learners, teachers, and the, and the parents. My study will give the better understanding of what exactly is happening right now in the classroom and where exactly the learners having the speaking problems. And because I believe if we know what learners do and what kind of problems they have, then we'll be able to develop the framework that will show the strengths and the weaknesses of the system. So with this framework, this framework that can be used by the stakeholders, the teachers, the students, and the government who can actually help to improve the speaking skills in uh, the country. Because I believe that if we speak English well as the international language, then we'll be able to understand and uh, uh, the, the understand because English is the language of business, communication, and science. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Tuspikova. You know, it is never easy to speak in another language other than your mother tongue, 
and requires lots of practice and practice and patience. I speak best in Kelantanese dialect. So um, can we have Madam Nurul Ain, please? Hello, hi. Um, well, judging on the engagement and communication, even though it's quite um, monotonous, but I can see your effort to really deliver your points. And uh, in terms of the comprehensions and content, whether there are some loose points for me to understand better, but I can see towards the end you try to give all, uh, all that you can to make uh, your points can be captured by the audience. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. The 10th speaker comes from the Faculty of Science and Technology, UKM. Mr. Muhammad Jeffrey Muhammad Yusuf will explain how monitoring air pollutants can be done using Hevia brasiliensis, the rubber tree. Please welcome, Jeffrey. Hello. Previously on my life, two years ago, I was riding my motorcycle and when I arrived, I wiped my face off using tissue paper. I was shocked when there were black dirt and dust coming all over from my face. I was like, what are these? Am I that ugly? Well, apparently, they were from the smokes of vehicles and various industrial activities that I gathered while I was riding. It got me thinking, this black spot and tissue paper signified somehow the environmental quality of the air that I just passed by. What about the plants that are constantly exposed to such environment? They would be a great natural indicator, don't you think? That inspired our research. We selected Hevia brasiliensis, or commonly known as rubber tree, to monitor air qualities of two different locations, Nilai versus Jerantut, urban versus rural area. Why rubber tree? Basically, higher plants, in this case, rubber tree, the species can be easily identified from afar, like uh, that is rambutan tree, this is rubber tree, right? Hmm. So, the plantations of rubber tree usually covers a wide range of area, thus representing location population. In this research, we collected samples of soils, tree barks, leaves and latex to be tested for the contents of the infamous air pollutants, which were heavy metals and polyaromatic hydrocarbons. The sampling was conducted once a month from April 17 until March 18 because we believe that monsoon cycle throughout the year might affect the accumulation rates of air pollutants. Based on our findings, our study proved that during raining season, especially in November 17, some of you might recall it as winter of Malaysia, the deposition of air pollutants were the highest. Meanwhile, in hot season of May 17, the concentration of air pollutants were the lowest. But it has been reported that rainwater helps in diffusing particulate matter of ambient air into the plant system, whereby in hot season, low humidity and wind direction hindered them to be absorbed by them. Surprisingly, Gerantut was not as innocent as we thought she would behave. The levels of air pollutants were merely the same as Nilai, the bad guy. And as for me, wherever I go now, I will always bring my tissue paper. Will you? Choices. Thank you. Yeah, okay. Thank you, Jeffrey. I think uh, certainly you brought your, your supporters, but I cannot truly understand I why. I did not pay them. <laughs> <laughs> They but, come willingly. Sure, I'm sure they did. But I, I thought that was a good presentation. I liked it the way that you engage your day-to-day -day experience and uh, daily happenings to the focus of your research. And I thought you did a good stepwise logical sequence in explanation, explaining about your research. So, uh, and it was very engaging. Well done. Dr. Hisham from Faculty of Engineering and Built Environment. Mr. Shuhairi's topic is development of expert system in quality services for bus. Please welcome. Global warming, air pollution, thin ozone layer is all caused about by carbon dioxide produced by a car in traffic congestion. Using a bus 
as a main transportation, using a bus to save global warming. 85% citizens in Malaysia don't use a bus. Ladies and gentlemen, how many of you are riding a bus for today? Thank you very much, none of you. You conclude my statistic. According to my research, there are two main reasons why people don't use a bus. Number one, the less connectivity between one system of the product transport and another system. Less connectivity. Secondly, according to the survey, the quality of service for the buses is very low. So how to check quality of service? How engineers want to check it according to the Transportation Research Board? Engineers will take two months and it costs about 100,000 ringgit Malaysia just to check a quality service for the bus for one city. That's come my thesis. My thesis to develop a system to shorten the engineer time and to reduce the cost. And this system will provide a rating system to the bus provider so that I can understand this bus is A, B or C in service. Plus, added from the expert, it will give a solution to that problem. According to my research, 70% of my participants, my respondents say they will agree to ride a bus if the bus is good quality. The bus quality service is good. They will agree on that. Imagine with the bus cost expert system can help the authority, can help the bus provider, can help the government to improve the bus quality service. Imagine that 70% of 24 million citizens of Malaysia will use a bus, which means 16 million people in Malaysia will use a bus and will save a global warming. I'm not a doctor to save a life. I'm not a scientist to formulate medicine. I'm just an engineer to save global warming. Me and you, let's do it together. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Shahiri. Prof. Ismail, please. Uh, thank you very much, Shahiri. I mean, I, I use public buses all the time. <laughs> thank I you very much, sir. <laughs> Especially in Kuala Lumpur. You know? uh, yes, uh, your, your topic is very relevant to all of us, and I'm sure mostly most students and elderly people, and also uh, the uh, foreign workers, I notice, they use uh, buses, you know, uh, but local. I know my colleague don't use because they have their own transportation. And you, you managed to share your statement problem and also give some suggestion in terms of try, trying how to try to resolve the situation. Thank you very much. Uh, you relate well uh, uh, with the audience. Thank you and all the best to you. Thank you very much, sir. Right. Our next speaker is an educator who will give a talk on interesting apps, Gram Room, a mobile learning to learn grammar module. From the Faculty of Education, give a round of applause to Mrs. Noor Azwa Muhammad Ozir. I just signed hello and good morning in sign language. I'm not a special education teacher, neither am I an IT specialist. I'm just a normal mainstream English teacher, but my deep interest in those two features is what brings me throughout my PhD journey. Gram Room, a mobile learning to learn grammar module. It's actually a grammar learning module which can be downloaded via Android or iOS smartphone. It is specifically designed for the hearing impaired students. Okay, when I taught in one of the nation uh, Premier Polytechnic, I took up the challenge to teach the hearing impact class, just one class. And I learned sign language, and my deep interest in IT is what motivated me to continue my journey. All right. 
the major concern of this developmental research study is to construct together the needs and the language learning strategies of the hearing impaired uh, students um, regarding their English language learning process and to construct together the content, the suitable contents and structures of the mobile module and all aspects of the evaluation of the mobile modules. Okay? The major problems that leads me to the, do the development of these apps is uh, the problem of the hearing impact. When they want to communicate with us, the normal hearing community, they will have to write. And from a preliminary study that I conducted in the Polytechnic, they can't even write a proper sentence. Why? Because this is due to their pattern of their sign language. When they want to introduce themselves, they will just say, they will just, sorry, they will just sign my name, Azwa, omitting the is. To them, the is, the are, the articles, they are not important. But to me, as an English lecturer, as an educator, I want them to write the correct sentence. So that is why the least I can do is to come up with this uh, application to motivate them, wanting them to really learn grammar, but they are not into reading the long notes of grammar. No way. So in Gram Room, I translated all the notes into sign language, into their language, so that they will have interest, motivate them to use the application to learn grammar, because they can play the sign language video repeatedly by themselves, without the teacher in front. They will try to, they will learn by comprehending their own sign language grammar notes. So, Gram Room is actually an application to help them enhance their grammar skills and to have a better writing skills so that they, they, can, they can be confident to talk, to communicate with us, the normal hearing community. Gram Room is not an app that can change the world, but it certainly will be an IoT that can have a great impact to my hearing impaired students. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Noor Azwa. Oh, Prof. Supian, any thoughts on Mrs. Noor Azwa's presentation? Okay. Uh, thank you. I think uh, when, when you came in and walked and then you immediately showed sign language, uh, then immediately we can relate, you know, to the thing that you're going to talk about throughout. And um, I think that is very, uh, very good. And that is just the strength that you already have. And um, the way you presented with, the, you know, nice tempo and good articulation, that, will be very, that is very helpful. Okay, good luck. Thank you. Actually, only my body is here. My mind is not here. Please help me to pray for my brother who is now fighting in ICU due to meningitis. Our next presentation too will be on education, emphasizing on identifying dyslexia using MIDAST. Please welcome Mr. Suhana Ahmad from the Faculty of Education. It is so frustrating to read a page full of reverse letters, especially when some of them look so much alike. Teapot, teacot or T dot, mind-boggling. Unfortunately, this happens most of the time to individuals with dyslexia, a brain-based condition that impacts reading, spelling, and writing. But what if I say this type of learning disability is also a gift? Children with dys dyslexia are blessed with various strengths. Reasoning about the movement of objects in 3D spaces is one of them. It's a gift that enables people to see things differently, like the minds of Einstein, Edison, and Picasso. When I ask English teachers how do they differentiate between pupils who have language learning problems from those who are experiencing dyslexia, all they could say was, it's not easy. So, I'm going to make it easy. I am developing Malaysian Dyslexia Accommodative Screening Test, or MIDAS, the first instrument to be specially developed 
to help teachers identify dyslexia among year one, year one pupils in primary school. Midas encompasses multiple tests, syllable detection, and rapid naming tests are two of them. In syllable detection tests, pupils' ability to identify the number of syllables in words is measured. For instance, elephant, three syllables, easy for us, but not for the dyslexic. In rapid naming tests, pupils' ability to name several pictures quickly is time. Both tests are easy for us, but not for them. So, a test manual will be developed to help teachers to use this instrument. Capable, but not capable. Those were the words used by our Professor Ulong, Datuk Dr. Shamsul Amri Baharudin, to describe children with dyslexia. 10% of Malaysian's population has dyslexia. Midas will help teachers to identify a reservoir of potentials and initiate the transformation of dyslexic children to their true capacity from goal to goal, just like a Midas touch. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Suhana. Madam Nurul Ain, your thoughts, please. Okay, Suhana. Uh, you walk in confidently. Very good voice projection. I like it very much and your topic as well. And uh, very uh, compelling content with your three minutes. So, very well done. Thank you. Thank you. Representing the engineering cluster, the next speaker is from the Institute of Solar Energy Research, Sri. Mr. Ali Alwaili will explain to us how to use nanomaterial to produce hot water and electricity from solar collectors. Testing, testing. All right. You ready, Mr. Alwaili? Yeah. The floor is yours. The main objective of the energy industry is to raise the efficiency. This means we want to raise the power generation and we want to reduce the costs. Now, I come from the solar energy industry, and in the solar energy industry, we have two main technologies. The first technology is called the solar cell. You can see it up here. It's also abbreviated as PV, which stands for photovoltaic. Now, this is a device that converts sunlight into electricity. If you install this on your rooftop, you will have free electricity during the day. Now, the other one is the solar thermal. As of the solar thermal, it has a particular pipe configuration, as you can see. Now, this will convey water. Now, it will absorb the heat of the sun, and therefore, you can provide free water heating. If you install this on your rooftop, you'll have free water heating. And so, where's the problem? The problem lies with the PV, because when the temperature of the PV rises, its electricity production will go down. Now, that's a serious problem for the end consumer, because it will shorten the lifetime of the device, and it will cause many problems throughout its future. So, there have been many solutions proposed by different researchers and facilities and so on. And we need truly to fix this problem, but the most, uh, the, the most, um, the most efficient way to solve this problem is to use a hybrid design. This hybrid design basically combines the two together, combining PV and solar thermal. What happens here is that the solar thermal will absorb temperature from the PV panel. Therefore, it will provide cooling and simultaneously it will gain maximum heat. Using this technique will provide you both electricity and water heating in the same space. Now, where's the innovation? The innovation comes when I'm using nanomaterial into the process. You might ask, what is nanomaterial? Nanomaterial are nano-sized particles. They come in, you can have them in, in powder form. You can see them here. Now, I use them in two different places. Place number one, I mix them with water in order to produce nanofluid because they have better thermophysical properties which means the cooling will be more efficient. I also use them with something called the paraffin wax, simply candles. You can find them easily in the market. And the reason why I did that, because paraffin wax has been used famously to control the temperature of the PV. Basically, we're providing cooling to maximize the electricity production and reduce the costs. Now, when you mix all these components together, you will get this novel design that I've used. This novel PVT design, and as of the results that has shown from my experimentation, has the highest efficiency of its kind. This 
design can be used in industrial and residential processes. It also can be used in the palm oil industry. Install this on your rooftop and you have a hot shower and you have electricity for your electrical appliances. Thank you so much and I hope that we make this world much greener. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Salwaili. Sorry, Mr. Alwaili, Prof. Zarina, your thoughts, please. Okay, thank you, uh, Mr. Ali. That was a very confident uh, presentation. Thank you. And I think uh, you managed to explain to me, a non engineering person, what were the actual concepts of your research. So that was well executed, I thought. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Means a lot. Thank you. Who can live without a smile? No one can. So this is the motto of Mr. Muhammad Milad, Muhammad Aboraz, a PhD candidate from the Faculty of Engineering and Build Environment, with a talk entitled Nano Crown Glory from Waste to Wealth. Please welcome Mr. Muhammad Aboraz. Ladies and gentlemen, how many people here in this room smile more than 20 times per day? Raise your hand if you do, please. Wow, congratulations. But out of this room, children smile as many as 400 times per day. The life is short. It's very short. Smile if you still have teeth. But the question is, what about people who don't have teeth? Ahmed and millions of people have the same situation because the cost of dental restorations is expensive. Actually, there are many reasons behind the high cost of dental restorations. Let me give you an important example. In dental clinics, zirconia blocks, or commonly known as dental ceramics, are used to fabricate nice crowns and bridges. However, the current process is not completely optimized because 55% from zirconia blocks are used but 45% from zirconia blocks are simply thrown away during the fabrication process of dental restorations. Just imagine, with more than 4,000 dental clinics here in Malaysia, it's a waste, ladies and gentlemen. Therefore, my research is helping by recycling zirconia waste to become better, stronger, and cheaper dental ceramics. Actually, my research was challenged. I spent a few years in the lab at Faculty of Engineering, Faculty of Dentistry of UKM. First, I collected zirconia scraps from dental clinics here in Malaysia. After that, I converted them to nano size powder. And this was the final product of my research. Wait, wait, still more. The nano size powder was then fabricated to become a new dental ceramics blocks. And this was the second final product of my research. Both final products were prepared using simple method with no additives that increases the cost. And the good news is my material can be used for many applications, including electric, fuel cell, and thermal applications. Ladies and gentlemen, I am confident that my dental ceramics can be used by people because my dental ceramic process reuses the waste, reduce the environment burden, money will be saved in the long run, and this will help people like Ahmed to smile again and have a happy life. Ladies and gentlemen, the happiness begins with a smile. What are you waiting for? Smile, please, and keep it. Thank you very much. Prof. Ismail. Yes, thank you very much, Muhammad uh, Milat, and good presentation, and quite comprehensive and clearly stated. And um, you were very relaxed and calm and confident. All the best to you. Thank you very much. Next to present her case is Ms. Li Zi Xiao from the Faculty of Social Science and Humanities. Let's see what she has to say on a responsive initiative to enhance the learning of multimodal oral presentation skills. Please welcome Ms. Lee. Good morning. I am an English language teacher in a Malaysian university college. Throughout the years, I realized that oral presentation skills are critical for employability and academic success, but the students really struggle with these skills. 
there are just far too many complaints. The employers complain. Graduates can't present properly. Students complain. Ma'am, ma'am, I have never done an oral presentation before. Swimming in this sea of complaints, I had to do something as a teacher. Supported by my experience and the body of knowledge done on the topic so far, I embark on an action research. I realise that we need more than a strong use of language to deliver an oral presentation. We need to engage visuals like how I'm trying to do today. We need to engage gestures like how hard I'm trying to do now. And we need to manage time like how I must finish this speech within three minutes today. In other words, we need to manage multimodal oral presentation skills. That's a lot to do. And to make things worse, teachers have not been systematically teaching them to the students. So I designed a responsive initiative to enhance the learning of these skills. What is it? It's a pedagogical plan that can be implemented in the classroom in one semester by a teacher. It contains learning tasks that students need to complete in order to master these skills. I identified 10 components of multimodal oral presentation skills, including content uh, ability, the ability to engage the audience, to name a few. And this plan was informed by the social cultural theory of learning, multiliteracy theory, and the students will learn through Web 2.0, videos, feedback, and collaborative learning throughout the semester. What did we find out by the end of the semester? The students improved in all the component skills, and this was shown by their presentation scores, the research diary done by the teacher, the Facebook tasks that they had to complete, and also the student interviews. One student even told me that this is the only class that I didn't skip because it was so engaging. All right, so in conclusion, why did I call my initiative responsive? It responds to the students' needs. I love the immediate impact of it. It responds to the teacher's need. I teach more systematically as a result, and I hope that when I share with other teachers, they will benefit as well. And because it interacts with theory to come up with learning tasks, it responds to theory as well. So, this drop of water in the ocean, who's just a teacher, is just one drop of water. But it certainly hopes to create ripples of positive change. Thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Lee. Prof. Supian, your thoughts, please. Um, you look a typical teacher. <laughs> Good. Thank you um, very much. Yeah, I, 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 uh, naturally, you look like, like a teacher, and the way you, you know, your body language, the way you talk, really like a teacher. You really represent a, a teacher. Uh, and I like the topic, and uh, you, you presented it well. Um, and, and, and other than that, I think um, you have a uh, good luck in your presentation. Yeah? Okay, thank you. thank you. Time does fly fast. We have arrived to the last contestant of the day. Our lucky number 17 is Mr. Wilfred Mokok Ho from the Faculty of Health Sciences. His topic is something that we need to ponder upon, the sustainability of childhood obesity programs. Mr. Wilfred, the floor is yours. Good morning. Good morning, testing. Testing, good morning. Take a look around you when you go anywhere next time. What you will see has become a new trend among children. Yes, childhood obesity. Obese children are suffering from both physical and mental challenges that will stay with them for their entire life. How many of you can recognize your feelings? Ladies and gentlemen, can you just imagine? One in seven Malaysian children is obese. Consider this as our wake-up call shouting at us to teach our children a healthy lifestyle since when the moment they are born. Many obesity programs have been conducted in school. My research, however, takes a slightly different approach by looking at the sustainability of childhood obesity program. What are the factors that are influencing this obesity program? I apply mixed method approach. 132 surveys and 102 interviews later. Yes, I have some answers. I collected answers ranging from, yes, I have loose weight, to my friends refuse to play with me. They say I am too fat and I can't move fast. To my mom told me not to exercise at night at the garden. 
or else I will be disturbed by ghosts. While we expect the main failure in sustaining childhood obesity are due to the unhealthy eating practice and physical inactivity. No, we discovered that the main reasons are due to the unsafe environment and lack of peer support to practice healthy eating and physical activity. And these are the reasons why those obese children, they refuse to practice whatever they have learned after attending this obesity program. However, on the positive response, when I ask the girls what makes time to practice healthy eating and to lose weight, they say, oh, we, we love girls' generation. We love their long legs and their slim body. This might explain why girls started to care about their body image at their pubertal age. The same questions I ask the boys, they say, I don't want to die from any diseases. I am just too young to die. This might explain why boys are more physically active at school compared to girls. My research reported factors that influencing the sustainability of childhood obesity program, which are the unsafe environment and lack of peer support to practice healthy eating. And I strongly believe that it is very important to consider those factors before implementing any obesity program. So let's say no to childhood obesity. Give up your fat, watch your belly flat. With that, thank you. Thank you, Wilfred. And last but not least, Madam Nurul Ain, your comments, please. Okay, uh, Wilfred, um, very good vibe and energy. I like your presentations and your three minutes are very well spent, Thank quite uh, comprehensive. Um, and say no to childhood obesity. All the best. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Nurul Ain. Thank you, Wilfred. Although Malaysian foods are very delicious and tempting, tempting, but the alarming rate of obesity in Malaysian children is going. Let us together give support on Wilfred's cause. So give it up. Give a big round of applause to all our 17 contestants. <laughs> so with the end of Wilfred's presentation, it marks the end of UKM 2018 3MT competition. We have listened to all 17 speakers and simultaneously learned 17 new things. I am positive that the audience will find the new knowledge we've shared today in some way would be beneficial. Can I invite the judges to step outside of this hall and to a designated meeting room accompanied by the three empty committee to deliberate the results? Yeah, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh dan salam sejahtera. Very uh, good morning to not good afternoon already, everyone. And I'm sure all of you are very nervous to wait for the uh, results uh, of the uh, uh, presentation. And uh, <coughs> Yang Berbahagia, Professor uh, Dr. Anda Nastuti, yeah, uh, advisor of the UKM Graduate Center, and chairperson, associate professor, Dr. Ashnid Ashnida, and uh, members of the organizing committees, uh, fellow judges, uh, Professor Zurina and uh, Puan Nurul Shuhaida from uh, TV personality, um, and uh, also uh, all the supervisors who are still here and curious about the result, and uh, participants and fellow students. Uh, first of all, uh, I feel honored to be uh, invited as one of the uh, judges uh, to this 3MT competition 2018 at UKM. And uh, overall, all, you, all of you have done a wonderful job. Give a big hand to you. All right, all right. Uh, in presenting your work in three minutes, and I know that is not an easy job. And I'm sure you had a split, sleepless night uh, to uh, work on this, right? And uh, I'm sure some of you have been practicing uh, non-stop. And, <coughs> and, and I, you know, I, I have been uh, supervising a lot of the PhD students. Sometimes I said to them, you need to present your uh, in 15 minutes, but even even then they go beyond half an hour and all that, and I think that's not a very good, uh, <coughs> I suppose, practice. 
And I'm sure um, <coughs> uh, you are also curious uh, in, uh, about your result. Uh, the result will be announced after um, um, s comments that we're going to make uh, soon. Uh, I'm taking this opportunity uh, to, congratulate, uh, to congratulate all the winners and to others, please try again, kalau tak berjaya this time in the near future. Uh, here are some of our comments, not just my comment alone. Uh, we have discussed this uh, with all of us just now. And unfortunately, uh, uh, Professor Sufyan is not here today because he had to leave. Yeah? Um, some of the comments are for the future uh, improvement that includes um, one is, uh, they're not really in, in the right order here. One is uh, using slide, yeah? Try not to use slide that has too much information. Sometimes your slide uh, is just too cluttered with information. And as a judges, we find it very difficult to look at your presentation as well as look at the uh, slide that you're trying to, you know, uh, uh, present uh, in front of us. And, and I think, I think that, that I think it has to be uh, clearly stated, yeah? Two, um, practice, practice, practice uh, your pronunciation, yeah? I know English is uh, not our mother tongue, and so we need to practice a lot and try uh, not to mumble. Some of you, some of you mumble and some of you uh, went too fast, yeah? So I think try to be relaxed and all that. And that takes a lot of, I think, practice and experience. And the third one is try to relax and not rushing your, uh, your presentation. And try to make your presentation as simple as possible. Uh, some of the presentation were too technical. Yeah, I mean, this is what we felt. Huh? Um, uh, because of that, you may lose your mark. Because some of your, some of the audiences are people who are uh, a lay person, and they may not may not understand uh, some of the terminologies that you have used in your discipline. Yeah, and um, especially if the judges are not from, uh, you know, uh, from sciences. Yeah, and um, the other thing is that use your three minutes fully, because some of you finish within like two minutes and uh, two and a half, but make use of about three minutes because you have a lot of information. In three minutes, I think uh, you need to talk about, um, yeah, try to utilize that time to talk about your uh, uh, problem statement, your findings, your methodology, yeah? Okay. Um, the other thing is, uh, again, uh, clearly state your presenting problem and methodology and also your finding. Because this is, I noticed some, some of the present, presenters uh, did not do that well. Yeah? And this is very important. And the other part, uh, one of the judges mentioned is grooming. Yeah? Uh, it's also important. The way you dressed up, yeah? uh, it helps uh, in your presentation. Um, I think, um, as you notice, some are very well dressed up and some are, are just don't take it, uh, you know, just take it lightly in terms of uh, dressing up. And also, um, try to look at the uh, audience directly and try not to engage with the, and try to, en try to engage with the people in, in, inside uh, this room. And uh, some, of, some of the presenters just look down on the floor and not, really looking directly uh, at the people uh, in this room. And I think um, that's about some of the comments that, that we have. Uh, perhaps before I uh, finish uh, here, maybe I would like to get um, some comments from uh, the judges. Uh, uh, Puan Nurul, if you have, you have anything to add, if not, uh, and uh, Professor Zurina. Uh, if you have. Prof has uh, summarized all of our uh, two points. We, we did discuss this. Um, just to say congratulations anyway to all of you, all winners already anyway, eh, to come this far. Okay. Well done. Okay. 
Uh, just uh, maybe two or three points, brief. Um, I think uh, Prof mentioned about their slide. Now, I know it's only one slide, but it's important to make sure you don't put too little nor too much. Ada juga yang macam very scanty, it doesn't give any idea except for the title. So I, I think that should not be the way because I think in our criteria, it's supposed to complement. Uh, on the other end pula, ada yang terlalu banyak information. So it becomes very cluttered and it's difficult. And when you have too many things on the slides, then as a presenter, you are maybe inclined to keep on turning. So when you keep on turning, you are also losing your contact with the audience, your engagement with the audience, and that's a criteria also. Uh, the second point is, uh, I think most of you spoke very well, okay, uh, to build up further on your confidence and intonation. Yeah, uh, I know we all ladies, eh, a lot of us kan ada macam myself so, I, my voice is a bit on the high pitch, but I think intonasi tu sangat mustaha. Right? So when you want to elevate your voice, make sure that it is at a intonation that is still uh, pleasant, uh, okay? But, but you all spoke very well, okay? And the third thing is, um, I noticed because when you present, and I understand that you are at least second year PhD students, right? So you would have some pilot or preliminary findings. I do find that because we judge you from a several criteria, so while some of you dwell a lot on the introduction, which is good because then you relate it to the day-to-day -day things, uh, maybe one or two presenters, I could not understand what was the impact and actually the focus of your research. Because maybe you spend too much time on the depan, right? And at the back too, they much a little bit tertinggal sedikit. Eh? So that those are my comments. But I, it was well done. Thank you, Professor. Okay, I just uh, want to add on a little bit uh, based on my expertise. <laughs> well, basically, the first one is just to relax. When we, kalau kita nervous and uh, kita jadi macam our breath become shallow and then our upper body part become tense. So that means you susah uh, hina. Before that, I think better take a few moments. Breathe dulu. Do amazing thing. Cuba breathe dulu and then you talk. It do very well. And then uh, open your mouth. Mulut tu buka sikit besar. Ah, ah. You know? Sometimes I think oh, mulut cakap macam mo, 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 mo. You just open out your mouth. You you guys start open your mouth well, wide enough. <laughs> you know? So macam mana voice projection to, you know, for your voice to come out and then the audience can really dengar, listen to whatever you are going to say. And then your posture juga. Your posture, stand tall, chest open. Ni ada yang slouch and then that makes you rasa macam takut and nervous eye contact to the audience don't look down because kita judges kita nampak everything uh, when you try to present yourself and then the last kali is focus on your voice voice ni bukannya macam it's not like you being uh, cakap uh, loud the, the, the tonation mana nak uh, mana nak emphasize mana nak mana nak uh, tone the voice down a bit mana nak so it makes a whole lot of difference uh, dalam presentation, especially when you try to um, explain about sciencing in the layman's term to, the, to your audience. Ituja, that's all my comments. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Dr. Zarina and Puan Nurul Shahida. Uh, I'm, I'm sure you are very uh, anxious to know the results, and I'm not going to take too much time uh, uh, talking about. Uh, you know, all your weaknesses and strength here. And on behalf of the, all of the judges, uh, we would like to thank the UKM Graduate Centre for inviting us uh, to, uh, to this event uh, this morning. And, uh, and also, uh, I would like also to take the opportunity here to thank all the supervisors, and I'm sure you have worked very hard uh, for your uh, supervisees, yeah? And I'm sure, uh, uh, and, and then I said, I, uh, uh, again, I'm going to take this opportunity to con congratulate uh, the winners, yeah? And then for those who have not been successful, please try again in the future. With that, with that note, I wish you all the best. Thank you very much. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you, Prof. Ismail. So I'm now taking... Uh, Madame Nurul Ain's um, advices on immediate effect. So eye contact, 
Breathe. <laughs> Chest open. Okay. Now I would like to invite the Director of Graduate Center, Yang Membahagia, Professor Dr. Andana Stuti Mukta, to the stage, accompanied by the three empty chairwoman, Associate Professor Dr. Ashinida Aladdin. Please welcome. I would like to invite the Head of Judge, Professor Dr. Ismail Baba, to the stage to receive a token of appreciation from us. Thank you, Prof. Next is Prof. Dr. Zarina Abdul Latif. And last, not but least, Madam Nurul Ain Nurul Shuhada. Thank you, Madam Nurul Ain. Uh, Prof. T and Dr. Ashnida, please stay on stage. So these three empty events will not be a success without the commitment from the three empty committee, and I think they deserve our clap of appreciation. <laughs> Thus, I would like to invite the head of each committee to the stage and receive the certificate from the Director of Graduate Center. Now, I would like to call upon Dr. Muhammad Rahim Kamaluddin. Dr. Nadratun Naim Mubarak. Dr. Suziana Matsaad. And Dr. Siti Fatin Muhammad Razali. Sixteen postgraduate students have participated have participated in the three empty semi-final head last February and they are all our bronze medalists. I would like to call upon their names and when I call your names, please be on stage. Mrs. Aspalila Alias from Faculty of Medicine. I would like to ask cooperation from the medalists to remain on stage throughout the prize giving ceremony for our next photo session. From Faculty of Social Science and Humanities, Mrs. Nadia Binti Yusuf. From Faculty of Information Science and Technology, and Mr. Christopher Kwa Wai Hyong, from Faculty of Social Science and Humanities.
Now we have arrived at the moment we've been waiting for. The results are in my phone. I'm sure that all 17 speakers and probably their supervisors are nervous too. Team is ready? To give you more suspense and a sense of thrill, the UKM3 MT committee has agreed for me to announce the gold medalist first. In no particular order, Mr. Ali Al Waili. Next, <laughs> next is Mr. Jasper Elvin James. <laughs> next gold medalist is a lady, Madam Lee Z Xiao. Next winner is Mr. Muhammad Milad Muhammad Aboras. Next is a research scientist from the Faculty of Science and Technology, Mr. Muhammad Jeffrey Muhammad Yusuf. Well, apparently we have more men than women on the stage at the moment, but not to worry. Next gold medalist is Mrs. Noor Hamzani Farizan. <laughs> the seventh gold medalist is Mrs. Noraisha Muhammad Noor. So we only have two spots left over. And the eighth one is Mr. Shuhairi Norhisham. And our last gold medalist, give a big hand of a round of applause to Mrs. Suhana Ahmad. Oh, congratulations to the supervisors too. Give it up to the supervisors. Congratulations to all gold medalists. The effort and amount of time spent by each and every one of presenters today are much appreciated. All speakers are winners today. And we would like to invite all the silver medalists to the stage to receive their token of appreciation. Miss Almagul, to speak over, sorry. Mrs. Azmawati Muhammad Nawi. Ms. Chin Chai Yi. Mr. Chin Chuin Hao.
Mr. Nazmi Harith Fazila. Mrs. Noor Azua Muhammad Ozir. Mrs. Noor Fazila Ahmad. And Mr. Wilfred Mokok Ho. We are now going to review the top three for each cluster. We will start with the social science category. The second runner-up is Madam Lee Zi Xiao. So I will announce the winner first. The winner for the social science category is Mrs. Suhana Ahmad. And our first runner-up is Mrs. Nur Hamzani Farizan. Now comes to the category of science and technology. Our second runner-up is Mrs. Nuraisha Muhammad Noor. The winner for science and technology category is Mr. Jasper Elvin James. And the first runner-up is Muhammad Jeffrey bin Muhammad Yusuf. <laughs> the last category to wrap up our prize-giving ceremony is engineering. Second runner-up is Mr. Muhammad Milad Muhammad Aboras. Winner for engineering category is Mr. Ali Alwaili. And our first runner up is Mr. Shuhairi Norhisham.